Now, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2, and I want you to buckle your seatbelts, if you will, because we are going for it. We're going to talk about the end times and about the Antichrist, okay? So, if you're wondering, is this church a heavy-duty church? They really teach the Bible? Yes, we do. Okay, so here we go. And this is going to be a great thing for us to be able to understand. Warren Warren Wearsby says this, the purpose of Bible prophecy is not for us to make a calendar, but for us to build character. So we're not trying to make a calendar, we're trying to build character. We're not going to go from the newspaper to the Bible, we're going to go from the Bible to the newspaper. And we're going to look and see what's going on. Now this is a subject that enthralls all of us. I can remember as a teenager, I wasn't even a believer in the Lord, I hadn't come to Christ yet, and I had a friend that had a heavy metal album. Remember the album's a big, I mean, vinyl album. He had this heavy metal album, and and back in the 80s, it seemed like a lot of devil kind of stuff was in all that thing. That was kind of their marketing tool. He said, This album sings songs about the end of the world. The last chapters of the Bible talk about what happens at the end of the world. And I was like, give me a Bible. I need to find out what's going on on this. So I was enthralled just that some kind of, and it was ghoulish and devilish music. I'm not saying you should go there for theology. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying as a teenager, I went, wow. Wow. And then I remember after I was a believer, we were sitting around uh, one of our friend's house. They had had a little party. We just had chips and queso kind of stuff, a few teenagers. And we started talking about the end times in the living room. And it was enthralling. What is going on? So we're going to hit it. I'm going to give you a lot, but I hope that you'll take your listening guide. This is going to be very key for you to be able to understand. And I hope that you'll understand what's going on with this and that we can talk about this and understand a little bit more. Now, before we jump into 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 is where we're going to be, so get your Bibles ready for that. I, I want to give you just a kind of a precursor of where we've been as we've been studying 1 John. 1 John is a book about comparisons. So at the top of your listening guide, I put three comparisons that we've gotten so far. Light versus darkness, that was chapter 1. Then we have love versus hate in chapter 2 to about verse 17. And then now we're going to talk about true versus false. So he's going to say at the very beginning, he's talking about light and then darkness, and then it's uh, hate and love, and then now it's going to be truth and false, and he's going to compare these two things. So we've piggybacked on that as a church and said we want to have an inner change in our heart. We want light, not darkness. We want truth, not falsity. We want love, not hate. We want to interchange these things in our life. And so we've had a a program we've been going through called Interchange. In the month of of October, we talked about interchanging busyness for solitude. And I hope that you did that. You got alone with the Lord. You got some busyness out of your life. You got some solitude in your life. In November, our interchange is we're going to interchange complaining we're going to give up for thanksgiving complaining for Thanksgiving in your, your uh, welcome guide that folds out real nicely. On the, you open it up and on the bottom left, right underneath the little note from me, we'll give you some ideas about trading, complaining for inter, or interchanging it for Thanksgiving. It's the month of Thanksgiving. Let's be thankful people. Well, John's going to talk to us today about truth versus false. Good teaching versus false teaching. Christ versus Antichrist. Now, here's what happens with bad theology. Here's what happens with bad teaching. It's like a bullet. It goes in small and it comes out big. Goes in small. Oh, what's the big deal? And then you let that go for a while and it comes out really, really big in the end. That can work out in your life. Something comes along and you go, well, that's that's no big deal. I'll just kind of take a little step off. But if you take a step off of one degree and you keep walking long enough, what happens? You end off, uh, end up maybe, you know, 15, 20 degrees off by the time you get there. So John is saying this is very important for good theology to happen in our life. We're going to take it just a a verse by verse, and I'm going to unpack these verses a little bit bigger. Hopefully we'll get through all of it. Maybe we will, maybe we won't, but next week we're going to talk about this as well. So come back for part two. Verse 18, 1 John chapter 2. Here's what it says. Children, it is the last hour. Do you believe that? And as you have heard the, that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. 
By this we know that it is the last hour. That word last, that's the root word from which we get the word eschatology, study of end times. So the last, the study of last times, the study of end times is what he's saying. So let me pose a statement to you and then let me prove it to you. We are living in the end times. We are living in the end times. I can tell you this right now, factual. You can kind of laugh at it a little bit. I say it with a smile. We are closer today than we were yesterday to Jesus coming back. That's pretty safe to say, isn't it? We're closer today than we were yesterday to Jesus coming back. We are living in the end times. Now, we know through the scriptures, now, the way that's defined in the Bible is basically after the resurrection of Christ on, it's the end times. That's how they define it. Now, we are getting closer and closer, though, to the end, or in the end times, to the return of Jesus Christ. Let me show you a verse of scripture. It's found in Matthew chapter 24. If you'd like to turn there, you sure can. Verse 3 through 14. And Matthew is going to give us, actually Jesus is going to give us in the book of Matthew. He's going to give us five things, six things that will show us talking about the end times. How can we know what's coming along in the end times? So let's look at it. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 3. And I'm going to enumerate them for you. Here we go. Verse, do we have verse three? Maybe we're, let me read it in the scripture and you'll just have to, then we'll get to verse six. Here's what it says in verse three. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, tell us when will these things happen? What is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Okay, so that's a good question. Verse four, then Jesus replied to them, this is number one, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying that I am the Messiah and will deceive many. That's the first thing. False messiahs. Verse 24, the same chapter says false messiahs and false prophets or false teachers. The second thing he gives us in verse 6. Verse 6, he says, you are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. That's number two. And same thing in verse seven, for nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Here's the third one. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all of these events will be the beginning of the birth pains. So we have natural disasters is number three. Then we have number four, and they will hand you over for persecution is number four. They will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will take offense and betray one another and hate one another. Verse 11, there are many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. That's going back. Number five, because lawlessness will multiply and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. Now here's verse six, and this is a good news one. This good news of the kingdom, good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world is a testimony to all the nations. So he gives us false messiahs. He gives us wars. He gives us natural disasters or birth pains. He gives us persecution. He gives us turning away. The love will grow cold. And he gives us that the gospel will go forth to the end of the world. So those are six things. And now let's look at these six things. And let's ask the question, are we in the end times? Let's ask the question. The first one is this, false messiahs. Lifeway Research tells us that in just in the United States of America, and you could go further out on false teaching all across the world by all means, just in the United States of America, there is up to 5,000 cults in the United States of America, and they're growing by 180,000 people a year. Now, it seems like with the internet, it seems like with all the research, it seems like with all the teaching that we could say, hey, this is not right. This is weird. This is crazy. So yet though, Jim Jones, David Koresh, and many more after him, coming into these places of false teaching, of false messiahs. I could list for you ones around the world, in Brazil, in China, different places, false teaching, false messiahs. Come and be a part of what my teaching is, they declare. I'm the messiah that will save the world and be able to be a part of it. So we see a growth in that happening in our days. Number two, we see wars on the increase. Do you feel like every time you turn on the TV, it's like somebody is fighting somebody? Well, let's look at just a graph. Not getting too granular in the graph. It's just basically two countries being at war. Let's look at from 1890 and going from 1890 to 1990. Do you see here in this top graph how it's just basically moving up and to the right in the last 100 years, this top one up here? That's the, the place. It's just moving up and to the right. 
So in the last 100, even more than 100 years, it's going up into the right. Now let's talk about natural disasters. Doesn't it seem like there's more natural disasters? Doesn't it seem like hurricanes, earthquakes? I mean, what's going on? Well, let's take from just 1950 until 2012. And you will see the uptick in the growing of natural disasters, uh, basically what's happening from a a weather-related thing. The red line is the economic aspects of it. And here we have, it's going up. So the wars are increasing. The natural disasters are increasing. The false messiahs are increasing. What about persecution? What about persecution? Does it seem like it's more dangerous to be a Christian nowadays? Does it seem like even socially more dangerous to be a Christian? Many of you remember in our particular country of, of, of when you were a Christian, that was like, yeah, sure, that was the norm and it was celebrated and, and pastors were respected in the community and all those sort of things. And now there's more persecution that comes against Christians. Well, let me just give you a, a, a news article here. There's a report that a group called Open Doors does every year, and this, let me give you a couple thoughts or a couple quotes from this. It's appalling that Open Doors has to report that persecution has increased again in 2016, so a couple years ago, and we are still at the worst levels of persecution in modern times. The spread of persecution has gotten worse, now nearly hitting every continent in the world. Another study, Christians continue to be the most persecuted group across the globe. According to a study given uh, uh, upcoming report by the Italian-based Center for Studies on New Religions, determined that 90,000 Christians were killed for their beliefs worldwide last year. This would be in 2015. And nearly a third were at the hands of Islamic extremists like ISIS. Others were killed by state and non-state persecution, including places like North Korea. The study also found that as many as 600 million Christians were prevented from practicing their faith in 2016. There's places that we used to be able to go on missions, we can't go anymore. I mean, people still go, believe me, God's work's still being done, but it's, it's more difficult, I should say, to go. Not that people aren't going, people are still going. It's a place of persecution and it's grown. It's grown, we've seen that. We feel that, but the studies actually show that it's actually happening. We just saw Pastor Brunson released from Turkey just recently. I went uh, two weeks ago, I was invited, Texas pastors, a group of Texas pastors, about 120 of us, were invited to a White House briefing. We were invited to go to Washington, D.C. We went to the White House, uh, and the building right next to it is the Eisenhower Building. That's where our meeting was, and about 120 pastors were a part of a pastor's briefing that they did at the White House. They had eight representatives from different departments, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Education, Department, you know, of all these different departments that are there. Well, the Department of Justice, or excuse me, the State Department was there, representative. Each one of these departments, now this is very encouraging, has a faith and opportunities liaison, a full-time staff member to interact with the faith community in every one of these departments in the United States. That's awesome. That's incredible to be able to have that. Yeah, we can cheer for that. Whether you like the president or not, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm just saying that this is a thing that's a good thing to interact with that. So we were invited in, we went in there, and I'll show you a picture of the briefing that was there. So um, we're having the faith briefing there, and that's the different departments that are there standing on stage. Each one of them gave a presentation, and at the end of it, and then I'll tell you what they said, all of the pastors, one of the pastors said, can we pray for you? They rallied around, and we laid hands on all of these department heads, or not, de- not the head of the whole department, but of the faith part of it, And that's us as pastors coming around for pastors in Texas, praying for them and saying, thank you. And we pray for our nation. And we, what an honor to pray on the White House grounds for our nation. What a great thing. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, does not matter. We should be praying for our nation. So praying for that. But you know what that they said? This is what they said that gets me the persecution point. Yeah, let's let's clap for that all campuses. (laughs) Praying for our nation. There's 55, 55 full-time staff members in the State Department working on religious freedom. 55 full-time staff members in the State Department working on religious freedom. Now, that's not just Christian, that's, I'm sure, you know, Jewish, Islam, Muslim, I mean, all, all the way across. And we believe in that, that's good. We, we want people to worship freely. We don't want anyone to be harmed. We grieve The the shots fired in Pittsburgh. So in that, it shows you, though, the persecution. We're speaking specifically about Christianity. 
but it shows you the persecution that's upticking over and over and over and over again. That's number four. Number five, it says the love of many will grow cold. Have you ever heard about this census group called the nuns? Not N-U-N, not Catholic nuns, not sweet ladies. That's not what we're talking about. N-O-N-E-S, nuns. They check on the census, religious affiliation, none is what they check. In 1990, 8% of Americans were in this category. By 2018, it had almost doubled to 15%. Four years later, in 2012, it had risen to almost 20%. Now, 35% of millennials do not identify with religion, which is double the amount of baby boomers that don't identify with religion, which is more than even the, the, the generation, the baby boomers' parents, World War II generation, 11% would uh, identify saying we have no religious affiliation. So let's think of, of, our, of our senior adult generation, 11% we have no religious affiliation. Our baby boomer generation would say 17% has no re- religious affiliation. 35% of millennials have no religious affiliation. So what does that mean for us as a church? We gotta be reaching out to millennials like crazy, does it not? And so in this, to be able to see that the love of many is growing cold, we are in the end times. We've got to share the gospel. We can't fight about petty things. We've got to go for it for Jesus. The days are short. The days are short, and people are turning away, possibly because we haven't extended the gospel to them in a winsome way. So I don't want to go to church. A bunch of fights, a bunch of trouble. I'll just do my own thing. And we come and we say, here's the good news of the gospel. Now, let me give you good news. Let me give you good news. The last thing it said at the end of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, not the end of the chapter, but the section we read, good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all the nations. There's what's called UUPG. It's an unreached, unengaged people group. It's a missionary term. Unreached. Less than 2% believers in Christ. Unengaged, there's no real, maybe there's not a Bible translation, there's no connection with those people. Unengaged people group, ethnos, group of people that are all connected together. Unreached, unengaged people group. Well, here's some great stats on that. Let me find it. In 2011, there was 3,800 unreached people groups. By 2015, there was 3,100 unreached people groups. So in that four years, it decreased by 700 people groups. Okay, the source of this and many of the other things I said is a book called The Stage is Set by Bryant Wright. It's a great book on end times and these things. So he speaks about this in this book. From 3,800 to 3,100, a decrease of 700 unreached, unengaged people groups. So that means somebody's engaging them, somebody's reaching them. We're translating Bible translations in our church, many Bible translations. We're sending people out. We're trying to do all that. We've got an unreached people group we've adopted, we're praying for and seeking to, to minister to. That drop of 700 hear this, this is awesome, is the largest drop in the history of Christianity. The largest drop in the history of Christianity. So while persecution is coming, missions is happening. And that is awesome. And the more we get our heart on missions, the more we'll be ready and the more character will be built in our heart, in our life with what's happening. So here's what I've tried to do in this belabored long point. I'm trying to prove to you we really are in the end times. And I've sought to do that by looking at Matthew chapter 24 and taking each one of the six things that he showed us there and show you either on a graph or with a statistic that it is moved up. It is moved up in a very short time period. And God is on the move. And that is incredible. So now let's ask the question. We're still kind of in this first verse of John, 1 John where children, it's the last hour. And I tried to point to you that it was the last hour. Even as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming and many, many Antichrists 
have come. By this, we know that it is the last hour. Now, let me explain to you on the back of a napkin, so to speak, the order of the end times, because you got to understand this to be able to take this. Now, let me say from the very beginning, I'm going to give you what's called the pre-tribulation, pre-millennial view, okay? Those are big seminary words to basically say the rapture of the church happens before the tribulation, Jesus returns before the millennium. You can disagree with this. That's fine. Lots of people disagree. That's no problem. We're all pan-millennial at some point, meaning it's all going to pan out, okay, at some point. (laughs) So I'm going to give you this thought. Now, let me tell you why I think pre-tribulation rapture. Number one, we have Old Testament examples with Noah and Lot and Rahab of people being rescued before God's wrath comes. Number two, the word church is not mentioned in Revelation 6 through 19 when it talks about the tribulation. And so, and then in 1 Thessalonians, it uses we for the rapture and them for the tribulation. So those are just a few thoughts of not just willy-nilly just throwing this out, but let me show you basically, and I've, I've put it a little key in your, in your listening guide here. Let me show you how this works on the back of a napkin. You've got three arrows and two lines, okay? The first arrow is up. That's the rapture, the rapture. The people of God... Those who know Christ, have the Holy Spirit in them, are raptured. They're taken up to heaven. Then you have the tribulation. Seven years of calamity is what that is. That's where the Antichrist that we'll talk about in just a moment, that's where he shows up. And I'll tell you more about him in a little bit. Then you have the next arrow is the second coming of Christ. Jesus returns this is an amazing moment. This is that, that moment that he returns in Revelation 19 on a, on a stallion, king of kings, lord of lord on his, on his uh, thigh. I mean, just he is showing up and man, it is a done deal at that point. Then you're going to have the millennium. The millennium is going to be the thousand year reign of Christ. So we have the rapture, church is gone, Uh, believers in Christ are gone, the tribulation, seven years of calamity, the second coming of Christ, then the millennium, which is a thousand year reign of Christ, and then you have eternity future, that this lasts forever, new heaven, new earth, and we're able in eternity to go forward. So here you have whole book of Revelation, a lot of stuff just put into three arrows in two lines. Arrow one, rapture, squiggly line one here, tribulation, second coming of Christ, millennium, and eternity future. This place right here is where the Antichrist shows up. Now, I put you a little key there for you so you could take that home. I hope that you write my graph. That's why we put the blank there for you so that you write the graph in that little area right there. And so that we can look at this, now let's get to 1 John for a moment, okay? Let's get to 1 John. You still with me? Still hanging with me? It's a big talk, I know, but hang with me, okay? There's three different types of antichrist, if you will, okay? It's very important. Number one is what he's talking about here in 1 John. He's not talking about the antichrist of Revelation. He's talking about a spirit of antichrist, a spirit that is against or instead of Christ. That's your blank. A spirit that is against or instead of Christ. Have you felt, have you seen, have you experienced where you're like, this is anti-Christ. Not the anti-Christ is a person of revelation, the beast. But this is anti-Christ. There's a spirit that we sense and we're like, do what? Suing for why? Against for what? Pulling out that? Changing this? There's a spirit of antichrist that is against the teachings of Christ. Against the gospel. Against who Jesus is. Opposed to Christianity and opposed to you. That is a spirit of antichrist. And it's all throughout our world. We understand that. We can see that. That is all over. It is all over the place. You look at 1 John chapter uh, 2, verse 22, a few verses later. Who is the liar if it's not the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? This one is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. 1 John 4, 3. But every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. And you have heard that he is coming and he is already in the world now. So there is opposition 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but of rulers, thrones, powers, and authorities. Satan is in control in a lot of ways. He's not in ultimate control. In our church devotional, this morning's devotional, if you didn't read it, that's okay. This was this morning's devotional that we've been going through for a year, and it says this, paragraph two, Satan hates your God. He hates Jesus Christ. He hates your faith. You should be aware of the devil's intentions. That's today. He doesn't like what's going on. He doesn't want what's going on. He's got our church in the crosshairs. He's got you in the crosshairs. He's got me in the crosshairs. He'd love to issue calamity. And so there's a spirit of antichrist that is in our world. Number two, there's false teachers. There's false teachers. It says in 2 Corinthians verse 4, 13 of chapter 11, for such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light so that there is no great thing, it is no great thing if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their destiny will be according to their works. So he's saying there's false prophets, there's false teachers. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light and there's folks that will deceive and they'll be able to to give false teaching. And here's the problem of us as Christians. We're sweet people. We're trusting people. We're kind people. We, We want to bring people together. We want peace. And so we can be naive and get pulled into something that's false teaching and it's taken away from the things of Christ. And it can appear to be even light. Now here's just a couple things how close are they to the Bible? What are they saying about Jesus? If it's been invented in like the last, you know, X amount of time, it's probably not right, okay? I just kind of have a, a, a two new is not good. But to be able to come through this and to say, okay, the Word of God, the Son of God, the deity of Christ, the inerrancy of the Scriptures, okay, 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 and to be able to do that because we've got to realize there's a spirit of Antichrist, and that spirit of Antichrist then begins to be in a place that we have, um, that we're able to see in our heart, or we're able to see false teaching come of that. Now, number three, number three, there's the Antichrist of Revelation. This is basically a satanic superman, if you will. This is where it becomes personified. This is the end of days in which in the tribulation time, it's called the beast, the beast comes and he is an antichrist that steps forward into power. I'll give you four characteristics of him in just a second. But let's just kind of have a little bit of a kind of a breathing break for just a second. Now, Everybody's been trying to guess who the Antichrist was for like all of history, okay? And here's the thing. Here's the truth about it. Satan does not know, and we do not know either, when Jesus will return. So he's always got somebody ready. See it? He does not know when Christ will return. So he's always got somebody ready. So the early church thought it was the Caesars of Rome, Easy one to think, right? They declared themselves to be deity. They oppressed the Christians. They said, it's got to be the Caesars of Rome. Then you go further along and we would end up with, no, it's Napoleon. As he's conquering throughout Europe, it must be Napoleon that's doing this. No, it wasn't Napoleon. Then we get to Hitler. Now, Hitler would have been a good one, wouldn't he? I mean, that would have made a lot of sense. Coming against the Jewish community, the ways of his evil, all of those things. People say, well, it's got to be Hitler. It's got to be Hitler. It's got to be Hitler. Then we go further along. And this one, you might get a little humor out of this one. Some people thought that the Antichrist was a man name, named Ronald Wilson Reagan. Now, why did they think that Reagan was the one that would be the Antichrist? Well, because Ronald has six letters, Wilson has six letters, and Reagan has six letters. We got to do a little bit better with our Bible than that, okay? I, I, I don't know that that's, that's how you figure it out by somebody's, you know, English name of how that works out. Then they thought, well, it's got to be Gorbachev. In 1988, there was a, a book literally entitled 
Gorbachev, could this be the Antichrist? So you had, and then particularly when Reagan was, it was an assassination attempt on all of the media, and then he lived, and well, that's got to be the wound that was healed to be able to come back. So people get kind of crazy on this. When I took Revelation in seminary, our seminary professor figured out, some of the class uh, people figured out that he could be the Antichrist, because his name, if you added it up just right, would add up to uh, uh, the right name of, of the right spelling of all the letters type stuff to be able to do that. Somebody said if you take 100 and you make 100 the first letter and then you take A is 101 and B is 102 and on it like goes like that, you'll end up with John F. Kennedy was the Antichrist. So I mean, people can get all over the place with this. Do we know who this is? No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't know. But there's evil and there's a personification of evil that happens all the time. Now, let me give you really, really fast. Okay, really fast. Let me give you four characteristics of what this person will look like, okay? And then we're going to have to kind of draw a line, and then you're going to have to come back next week, okay? <laughs> Is that a good teaser or what? <laughs> next week, you'll get the rest of it. Here we go. So what will the Antichrist be like? Four characteristics. Number one, he'll be social. Social. There'll be an eloquence, and there'll be a wisdom to him. It won't be a pitchfork and a tail. It wouldn't be this, yeah. People will like him. He'll be eloquent, he'll be winsome to be able to do that. Now, number two, he'll be moral. He'll be a complete deceiver and ruthless to the core, but he'll step forward as a moral solution to all of the ailments that are happening in the world. He'll solve all sorts of problems, he'll take care of all sorts of things. Number three, he'll be political. He'll have a treaty with Israel, he'll break that treaty with Israel. He'll be political and he will be a person that will be masterful at bringing peace. And people will go, wow, this is the leader we needed. This is what we've been looking for. Look at what happened in this. Now, are we against peace because of this quality of the Antichrist? By no means, we're for peace. But it will be a place in which it will be a trick basically that is happening. And then number four, he'll be spiritual. He hates God. He desires worship and what's called the abomination of desolation. He will actually set himself up in the temple to be worshiped. And people will say, this man's incredible. This man's awesome. This person is amazing. And look at the peace that, they, that he's brought. And look at the, the social skills that he has. And look at the morality uh, in the sense that we can lift him up as a leader to say, way, that's a great person. And then look at all the things that have happened. And now come and worship. And he will receive worship. And watch, because he will be anti Christ. We worship Christ. And he will say, no, worship me. And so that will come. And so the question that John is putting before us in 1 John, will you fall for it? Will you fall for it? End time study is not for us to develop a calendar. It's for us to build character. And so what this is to do for us is this is to give us a heart that says, we're going for it with you, Lord. We want to love you. We want to stay close to your word. We don't want to be biblically illiterate. We don't want to be duped. We don't want to be tricked. We don't want to be moved in a different direction. We want you and you alone. Let me show you one last verse because I just can't in my good nature or in my, my, uh, my heart, my spiritual heart, leave without this verse. It's so key. Verse 19. They went out from us. Notice a they and an us. But they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. Who's the us and here, who's the them? Here's my quote or here's my, my point in your listening guide and then we'll stop here. Some are in the church, but not in Christ. Some are in the church. Did you see what it said in verse 19? They were with us. And they went out from us. Why? Because they weren't one of us. And I want to plead with you at every campus, at every place, with the depth of my heart for Jesus, I want to plead with you. If you're in church and you're not in Christ, it makes no difference in the end. Being a member of a life Bible study class, being the mem a member of our church, being a, a attender of our church, being a deacon being a pastor, being a staff member, if anyone is in the church 
and you're not in Christ, oh, I call you to come to Jesus. I call you to come to Jesus. The stakes are too high for us to play Baptist, for us to play denomination, to play, I've been a member since XYZ, to play I always show up. If you don't know that you know that you know Jesus in your heart, you need to come to Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. And I cannot end this message without that point. Because you can know everything. And you can have a timeline, and you can explain to a friend on the back of a napkin, and you can read a book, and you can figure out all sorts of different things. You can say, oh, yeah, it's terrible. The world's getting worse and worse and worse. But if you don't have a personal, you've trusted in Jesus to be your Savior and trusted in the grace of Jesus Christ, that it makes no difference when you stand before God. We are in the end times, and I don't say that to scare you. As a believer in Christ, I actually go, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. I welcome Jesus coming. There's more to do, but I can't wait till I see him face to face. If you're not a believer, come to Jesus today. Today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment to mean it from your heart. Come to Christ today. Jesus, we come and we thank you, Lord, that all of end times discussion is to bring us to the cross and the resurrection and a relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, if anyone is in church, but they're not in Christ, reveal that to them so strongly, Father, at every campus, that they would connect with somebody, they would talk with somebody, they would pray in just a moment to put their hearts to the Lord. For those of us that are in Christ and in church, may we be people of the gospel, Lord. May a generation of millennials not go down because we're too busy worrying about what we want and like. God help us. Thank you, God, for the ways you're on the move in missions and in our city, in our nation, our world. If you're not for sure that you're in Christ, Would you turn to Jesus? Not turn to me, turn to Jesus. To give you words to just speak to the Lord. But they have to be from your soul. They've got to be from you, not from me. I'm just trying to help you. First, that you would acknowledge your sin and just say, Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I'm not perfect. I need a Savior. Pray those things to him. Then to say where your salvation is coming from. Jesus, I ask you to be my savior. You were perfect. You died for me. You rose again for me. Save my soul, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. thank him Jesus I'm thankful that you are all I need I thank you that your grace is enough I thank you God that you dwell in me through the Holy Spirit I thank you that I can become a believer in Christ today if you prayed that and you meant it with your heart, please come talk to somebody at any of, our, any of our campuses. Let us help you. Believers in Christ, rise up. Walk in knowing what days we live in. God, build our character. We love you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.